Good morning. Reverend Clifton Sear. Um, our pastor Matt is away on a conference this week, so it is my pleasure to introduce Pastor Clifton. Good morning. My name is uh, Clifton Sear, pastor retired and pastor emeritus of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church back in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Thank the Lord. The snow wasn't as bad as feared, and uh, we were able to make it in, in good time to be here with you. I enjoy going to all the different places that I've been supplying. It's a, it's a joy, and I uh, Pray Pastor Matt has a, a, a good uh, experience with his conference. So I will turn it back to Ilona for the rest of the announcements and the reading of the mission statement. Please repeat after me uh, our mission statement. We respond to Christ's love, love by feeding those who are body, body mind, mind, and spirit. spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in the good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Let us freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. The boundless grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, and the light of the Holy Spirit be with you all. to God. 
Let us pray. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. Thus says the Lord. Lord, 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 Lord. Cursed are those who trust trust in their mortals mortals and make flesh flesh trace, 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 trace. Whose hearts turn away from the Lord, they shall be like a shrub, and I see when relief comes. They shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Bless those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious and does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? If the Lord tests the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings, word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Meditate on 
reading from St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For, the de for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we, of, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they execute, exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I know I'm actually on the wrong side of the altar this morning. I should be over here to my left at the pulpit. But the light's out above. It's a little bit short. And I'm old. I need the light and I need it closer to my face. So if you're not offended by me from preaching at the lectern instead of the pulpit, all will go well. Dieting is a national epidemic. Many restaurants like Subway and Burger King, just to name a few, have carb-friendly diets. Too bad there isn't a COVID-friendly diet. But once upon a time, there was a physician that placed the mother of a family on a strict diet. She and her husband decided it was a good time to change the entire family's 
eating habits. There would be limited red meat, no heavy gravies. Oh, that's bad in Dutchland. And no sugary desserts, no shoe fly pie. Oh, terrible. Instead, there would be fresh vegetables and fish. So the evening arrived of the first challenge of the new diet. It consisted of fish and cauliflower. Well, it was a bit of a shock for young Jeremy, the family's youngest child. The family started to eat grimly, and Jerome was chewing on a piece of fish. He discovered a bone. He pulled it out of his mouth and said, Dad, what should I do with this? The father replied, put it somewhere where you won't eat it. Immediately, Jerome placed the fish bone in the cauliflower. When we think of our gospel lesson for this morning, the woes of the Sermon on the Plain strike us as fish bones in the gospel. We like the blessings, but the woes are worrisome. The blessings give us a good feeling, but the woes remind us of our responsibilities. Because we like upbeatness and positivity, it's easy for us clergy, and I'm guilty of this, of being spiritual cheerleaders and avoiding such things as the woes. Ah, the blessings we'll hang on to, but those woes shake us all up. Nobody wants to hear what the woes have to say to us. We like to be nice people and liked by all. Certainly, we love a word of affirmation, a word of guidance when it comes to the services of God's word. We have enough woes outside these four walls. We want to recharge, get direction, get affirmation, so we can go out and do the Lord's will in the world. But the word of God is unfortunately a two-edged sword. Sometimes it brings down the proud and the arrogant. Sometimes it makes the comfortable feel very uncomfortable. In some ways, the meat of the gospel has some bones in it. Well, our gospel lesson for today is an example of that two-edged sword and bones in the gospel. The idea of the Lord and all the people being on a level place is somewhat intriguing from the get-go. I don't know if Luke the evangelist intended this, but a lot of business people in our day and age talk a lot about playing on a level playing field. The idea is that no one has an advantage over the other. Everything is, in essence, equal. During the time when Jesus was healing the crowds from disease and unclean spirits, he looked at the disciples and preached a very significant sermon. Specifically, he pronounced blessings for the poor, blessings to the hungry, blessings to the mourning, blessings to those who would be persecuted. The Lord promises relief and compensation to hurting people. That part sounds really good, doesn't it? Most of us have suffered for one reason or the other. Maybe we've lost a loved one. Maybe we've suffered from a disease. Maybe we've gone hungry. Maybe we've had really sparse finances at times in our life. And then there is sometimes the public ridicule because we refuse to participate in unbecoming activities for a Christian. You know what I mean. We maybe were called goody two-shoes by others or even religious fanatics. We just don't always fit in the in crowd. To those who are in the depths of despair and struggle, God says, take heart. You are blessed because you are precious to God. 
you know what it means to rely upon the Lord and not the things of this world. Too often we take comfort in our popularity or our bank accounts. But there is no true security in any of that. The only true security is in the Lord. In short, on the day of reckoning, the Lord will make sure that the have-nots have. And those who have sacrificed for Christ will have plenty. But it doesn't stop there in our gospel lesson, does it? Jesus makes clear that there's a day of reckoning. This is the fish bones that come into the gospel. There will be a day when the playing field is leveled to make everything equal. To the arrogant in crowd, that is to say, those who put their trust in their own abilities and their own resources, God promises that there will be a tremendous humbling. For the rich who use their money on themselves, and that's in Luke that's very clear. In the Gospel of Luke, which I did my doctorate in on stewardship, money is not evil. But how we use our money says something about who we are. It's not bad to have money. It's how you use it that's important. And so, those who are rich can expect nothing in return. Those who are filled will become hungry. The laughing will be weeping and being mournful. The in crowd will all of a sudden be the out crowd. This is the great reversal of fortune at the time of God's judgment. Our wealth and more importantly, our greed might be like a fish bone that gets stuck in our throat. Everyone will become accountable for what they have or have not done in this life. Those who think only of themselves, the arrogant, the proud, are themselves insensitive to the needs of others. And this is what creates the predicament. When we turn off the needs of others to suit ourselves. I think that's where Mahatma Gandhi had it right. Of course, you know, he did go to church in his early years. He once said, there's enough for every man's need, but not enough for every man's greed. Maybe he stole that from Jesus. I don't know. Without a doubt, the theme of God's lifting the humble and casting down the proud is spread throughout the Gospel of Luke. Indeed, there's the Song of Mary in Luke 2 where we see how Jesus will bring about a great reversal. Without a doubt, the Lord calls all people into an accounting. At this point, it's crucial to remember that Luke's Gospel, and this is crucial, Luke's Gospel is instruction. It's like a catechism. The very purpose of even the woes is to be instructive, not destructive. Now, what do I mean about that? Why does Luke write down these woes of Jesus? It's to remind us not to be greedy when there are needy. It is to remind us that we are accountable. God loves all of creation. And we are not to be haughty, we are to be caring. Because we are the baptized children of God, we are stewards of our Father's world, the whole world. We are in a very special position on this earth. We know that we own nothing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We know that we were bought with a price, our Lord's very life. And we are called to share that good news of our Lord's death and resurrection to the ends of the earth. We are called to manage the things of this earth. This is ultimately an incredible privilege and responsibility. Stewards are called to manage and stewards are called into accountability. Stewards know that it is God's gift of grace that has made us the children of God. It is not something we deserve. We did not earn it. 
We Lutherans are very fond of saying we are justified by grace through faith, apart from the works of the law. That is human effort. Everything we have is a gift. And we are called to respond to that gift. One disquieting aspect of our stewardship task is, as a society, most of the world considers us rich. In truth, we are. We might not feel rich, but not many of us are eating out of garbage cans and drinking polluted water. What we need to do is go back to the idea of enough for need and not for greed, and that we are called to share our resources for those who are needy. It's not just about money. It's also about our time. Do we come and help out others in food pantries, helping out the church, doing other acts of kindness and love. God's saints don't retire on this side of heaven. That's what my son and wife have been telling me. I may be retired, but I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be nice to be done? It's not until we go to our final rest that we are done. We are stewards until we die or some illness incapacitates us. While visiting a congregation member a few years back, she, she kind of summarized in a small way what living stewardship might mean. The parishioner said to me, Pastor, I try to do at least one nice thing for somebody every day. What a great start. Do one nice thing for somebody every day. And of course, we go beyond that, of course. But what a great start. What a wonderful way to live the Christian life. To be a positive influence out in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We're supposed to be caring and compassion when others are pulling at the choke collar to bite us. Well, as the baptized and spirit-filled children of God, we share this gift of stewardship in the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the Lord's. We need to think about that and reflect. Can those woes, which are fish bones, actually instruct us as to how we are to live? Remember, being instructive rather than destructive. We know, as Luther so well said it, we are at the same time saint and sinner. Simul usus et peccator. We will never get it totally right. We need this instruction to show us the way which in past years, Lutheran theologians have called this the third use of the law, the instructive use of the law. So the woes are there to instruct us, not destruct us. What can we learn? It helps us set our priorities. We're imperfect in this world. We'll never get it right. And that's why it is the love of Christ that will help us through. It's Christ who will save us. We cannot save ourselves. So all this is Christ doing. I like the metaphor of when the Spirit of God has been placed upon us in baptism, when we are living the Christian life, it's like old faithful geyser. We've seen it several times when we were visiting Yellowstone. After through a period of time, the pressure mounts, and boom, the water goes everywhere. That's the way the love of God is in us. It wells up in us, and whoosh, it goes out into the world. That's not our doing. That's the work of Christ. So the woes, the fish bones, are there to give us some direction on how we are to live as stewards of God's grace. This is the goodness of Christ responding with acts of love. Those acts don't save us, but because we are saved, we do those acts of love and mercy. Remember, we want to avoid those 
fish bones of self-centered greed and selfishness. Our Father has made us right through Jesus Christ. In short, we have been blessed to be a blessing to others. Amen. Gathered in one by the Holy Spirit, let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Blessed are those whose trust is in you. Strengthen the faith of those who profess your name and bring reassurance to those who doubt or fear. Through your church, speak continued blessing into the world. God of grace, Hear our prayer. Those who trust in you are like trees planted by streams of water. Bless fruit trees with an abundant harvest. Protect rainforests from destruction. Restore land that has eroded after deforestation. Resurrect woodlands after forest fires. God of grace, hear our prayer. Search the hearts of those who govern, that they lead with humility. Inspire leaders to collaborate on policies that protect people and the planet. Sustain truth tellers and social movements that challenge society to become more honest and just. God of grace, hear our prayer. Send your blessings of mercy on those who long for consolation. Tend to those struggling with poverty, unemployment, or uncertainty. Provide for all who are hungry. Console those who face persecution. Grant peace to all who suffer. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
Renew this congregation in our shared mission. As we plan and dream for the future you are preparing, inspire us by examples of Martin Luther and all the reformers. Bless new projects and new ministry partnerships. God of grace, hear our prayer. Christ is raised from the dead, and so we cling to the hope of the resurrection. We praise you for the lives of the saints who have lived and died in the hope of eternal life with you. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift up, we lift these and all our prayers in you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us show the sign of peace. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table. Nourish us with this heavenly food and prepare us to carry out your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light, amen. I would remind those who are at home especially that as we hear the words of institution that you remember as you, it is your custom to raise your cups at the appropriate times. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations in the waters of the Jordan. You proclaimed him your beloved son, and the miracle of the water turned to wine. He revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. the beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to do your will. Blessed are you for your son, Jesus, the word made flesh. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate. Power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to God's table. There is a place for you, and enough for all. body of Christ given for you. Amen. Don't eat it. <laughs> the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. 
We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoice over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in, today and forever. Amen. peace. Rejoice in Christ our Savior. Thanks um, be, be to God. God.